Welcome to yet another episode of Shortcast Over Coffee. Today, my guest is Pranay Kotasthani. Pranay is the Deputy Director of Takshashila Institution and chairs the High Tech Geopolitics Program. He co-writes Anticipating the Unintended, a newsletter on public policy ideas and frameworks, and co-hosts Puliyabazi, a popular Hindi-Urdu podcast on politics and policy and technology. Pranay is an alumnus of NIT Suratkal and has worked in multiple Fortune 500 hardware companies before joining Takshashila. Pranay's recent book has come out titled When the Chips Are Down, A Deep Dive into Global Crisis and is available on Amazon. In this episode, we will talk about the semiconductor industry, its impact on geopolitics and India's foray into semiconductor manufacturing. Please do like, share, and subscribe this channel as it will help us get such great guests on the show. And for all the audio files, do check out the show on Shortcast Over Coffee on top podcast platforms like Spotify, Apple, etc. Now, without further ado, let's dive right in. Hi, Pranay. Welcome to the podcast. Hi, Bala. Thanks for calling me. Good to be here. <laughs> You know, for a second, I had a doubt in my mind if I'm talking to Pranay or Fahad Fasil from Bangalore days. <laughs> for those of you who are uh, watching this on YouTube or, or the video version, uh, you will exactly know what I'm talking about. So yeah, that was quite a surprise to me. Yeah, I have gotten this before as well. Yeah, I wish I could have 0.1% of his acting skills, but yeah, <laughs> why not? Awesome, awesome. Uh, Pranay, your book is... Uh, has launched uh, when the chips are down a deep dive into global crisis you co-authored it with abhira manchi how was the process like and what does the book talk about yeah so you know a lot about this industry so the idea is the book is written from an indian perspective uh, the idea we began working on this since 2019 and we really started working on it once uh, President Trump had restrictions on Huawei uh, and before that it was on ZTE and then restrictions on Huawei began and at that time I sensed that there is something going on in this industry. Uh, semiconductors are becoming a conversation in geopolitics. Uh, uh, before that these two were very distinct spheres so uh, I come from the semiconductor industry and once I came into public policy in 2013. There was not much that you could combine in uh, the, this area, right? Uh, in fact, like you know, in, even in technology throughout the decade of 2010s, no one really considered hardware as even technology, right? Like largely people used to talk about software and chips were this commoditized product that will just, you will get it uh, whenever you want it. It was not uh, cool. But yeah, it wasn't cool for a long time. Uh, but since 2019, uh, once geopolitics got into the way, uh, there were a lot of interesting things which started happening. So 2019, I started writing about this. And we thought, okay, there's something happening here. We should keep a watch on it. Then I developed a course on this. Uh, and when I developed a course, uh, I started teaching at our public policy uh, course. We have a technology policy specialization. So during one of those uh, iterations of the course, I met Abhira, who was uh, a student in that cohort. Uh, and he also comes from the semiconductor industry. So uh, then after that, uh, I did a few talks. So some people said, you know, maybe you should write a book on this Um so that got us thinking uh, and both of us started working on that uh, every Monday 9 p.m. We used to meet uh, on call just like this. We started collaborating uh, on this, um, did an obsidian note uh, thing, vault, which we started building over time. And through that, uh, over two years, we finished the book. So that was the entire process. In between, there was a book which came on semiconductor geopolitics, chip war, which you would have heard. Um, and that uh, we were around three fourths of the way already into our book when that book came. And when I read that book, uh, my uh, decision to write the book solidified further because that book doesn't mention India at all. 
Uh, in fact, it has two mentions of India. Uh, and I thought India actually is a very crucial node of the supply chain. So we should write about it. And I also don't agree that this is a war. I don't think this is a war. What is going on in, from uh, uh, war is something very different. And we can probably discuss about that. So uh, I that solidified that we should you know quickly finish our book as well. And that's how it has come about. Yeah, again, talking about the book Chip Wars, it's a, it's a book by Chris Miller. Uh, uh, I think he's a professor of history in Tufts University in Boston. And um, yeah, uh, I don't think it's a war, but it's probably a cold war, like, you know, people flexing their muscles uh, uh, on soft power and and all of that. Uh, and uh, fantastic story. Um uh, uh, it's it's up for up for grabs at Amazon when the chips are down. A deep dive into uh, a global crisis, and I think uh, Chip was mostly talks about uh, China and the U.S. and Taiwan and TSMC and all of that, and not so much about India, like you said. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, so uh, the book does an excellent job of focusing on the individuals who created the industry. We take a more of institutional approach because our background in public policy makes us always ask that question, right? Why uh, did some nation states get there, whereas other nation states couldn't? You know, why couldn't USSR, China, and India not build a great semiconductor industry? China got there much later after um, the 1990s, etc. So uh, those are the questions which fascinate me, right? Uh, can space and nuclear powers be good chip powers? These are the kinds of questions which interested me. And uh, that's how you know, we sort of took that route. And also one thing is, yeah, as you said, it's not a war in the sense it is probably a contestation, a competition. Uh, but war has a special meaning in the American context, right? You have had wars on terrorism, wars on drugs. So this is another wars on chips. Right, right. As in, uh, to rally domestic forces, the war analogy and narrative is very important in the American system. So uh, that's why I guess war uh, is used. But it gets us into a cognitive block because one, uh, US and China haven't decoupled on semiconductors. It's only maybe five nanometer chips and very. Uh, below 14 nanometers uh, in the case of memories, etc., which are uh, blocked. But rest of the industry, the trade between US and China is ongoing, right? I mean, in fact, US companies won't survive if they don't supply to China. So there is no war as such. There's a denial of certain chips which US thinks uh, have end-use applications in military, etc. So that is another reason where there's no decoupling like in the Cold War, right? Cold War, the US and Russian systems were very much decoupled. It was not as if uh, US electrical systems were being used by Russia and uh, vice versa. But this that is the case in uh, the current context. Uh, so that is a second reason. And the third reason, and most importantly, I feel... Uh, to resolve the current crisis in semiconductors, actually, you will need some form of interdependence. You can't dissociate completely. So once you take the war analogy, uh, you will start thinking of who will be the winner, who will be the loser. Uh, but there are uh, you, there are no winners and losers here. Um, you, it's very tough to say that US has won something or just because China has made some alternative, it has won uh, again, right? So you get into those uh, mindsets and frames of thinking which are not conducive to this industry hmm. structure. Yeah, you summed it up perfectly because uh, no country can uh, exist on its own uh, because the world is such that uh, different suppliers, the whole supply chain is managed by uh, different countries. And I, I like the way how you broke it down um, as to how it is different from the Cold War, uh, where US and Russia were completely separate and all of that. And I'm sure the... <laughs> The word war was used to uh, have the books uh, have the book fly off its shelf. So that's uh, that's a common uh, that's a common thing that we see. Uh, Prane, uh, 
I have always wanted to ask you this. Uh, what is the, uh, is there a story behind the name? Because uh, Pranay Kotasthane is not a name uh, that is pretty common. So uh, is there any story, history behind it uh, about the last name? Mm. That's not something that I come across commonly. No, there are many stories, but I myself don't know, actually. Uh, it's it's a surname, which is, uh, it's a Marathi surname. So uh, I have heard that it is a common surname, not common, but it, there are many other Kotasthanis I know in and around Pune area. Uh, but my family comes from Indore, Madhya Pradesh. So largely uh, I'm uh, Marathi, but not a Maharashtrian. <laughs> And I've been there, uh, my family, uh, my relatives and all still there, stay there. Uh, but I really don't know what that term means, you know. Uh, there are stories, uh, people say that it is probably related to court, which means the fort and someone who was probably guarding the fort or something like that. But I really have no idea. And our uh, family, because it moved away from Maharashtra, so we don't even have a lot of connections uh, to trace five, six generations back. So I don't know. Yeah, but it's an interesting surname. So yeah, I that's that's it. I think whenever people notice it, they register it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So good. Absolutely. Because... Um... You know, it, it, it's amazing how many surnames and uh, how many kind of cultures that we have in India. It's it's such a such a multitude. Um, yeah, and and yeah. It, it always amazes me. You know, the, the, you know when you realize that you have met Sharma's, Singhs, and all of that, and then you realize that you you're meeting someone with a completely different surname that you have not come across ever in your life. Anyway, fascinating. Um, so Pranay, I know you went to NIT Suratkal, a uh, great school, one of the best schools in India, one of the best colleges in India, that is. Uh, and then you had a, a stint in the semiconductor industry yourself. Uh, so tell me a bit about your background. Yeah, so um, I always wanted to do engineering since uh, yeah, grade 7th or 8th. Uh, never wanted to get into medicine and at for people of my age group, you would realize engineering or medicine was one on that note, thing. On that note, yeah. I've had guests on the show who did their college in the 70s, in the 80s and the 90s. And every single yeah. person has said the same thing. During yeah. my time, yeah. it was engineering or medicine. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, probably in that era, there was also... Yeah, maybe government was also a realistic option. But uh, yeah, for me, I start did my engineering started in 2003. Uh, so by that time, uh, government was never an aspiration, like uh, in the sense you want to do something in uh, engineering or medicine outside that. And one area that uh, sort of, yeah, engineering was always something that I was interested in. Uh, and uh, always elect electrical electronics that fascinated me the the television has always been a fascination for me just uh, i find it mind blowing that something works the way it does you know you can do raster scan and you can create images just out of thin air this was always a fascination so um, i wanted to do electronics engineering got that in a good college uh, and I, I, most of my schooling has been in goa by the way so uh, uh, and i got into engineering at suratkal picked that up uh, did reasonably well there and then got a job in a, uh, again i wanted to work in an electronics company not in a software company and got a job in texas instruments so worked there for around six six and a half years largely doing design for test in uh, in the bangalore office and then worked for uh, around 11 months for qualcomm india uh, and during that time i i was always i thought i thought seven years in this industry I enjoyed that but I was looking for something else uh, in the public policy space so I did the course that Takshashila uh, teaches on public policy myself so I took that as a student in its fifth cohort uh, and found that quite intriguing so uh, I thought let, uh, let me try this and yeah it's been 10 years <laughs> since that uh, step and I took a 
full took a plunge in this field in 2013 and since then i have been working at the intersection of public policy public finance geopolitics foreign policy and now technology policy so it's been a fun ride mm. so before you took the takshashila course you had absolutely no trust with uh, public policy at all like in uh, so what i'm trying to say is that in in school or college uh, you were never interested in how the courts work how the judicial system works and, no, and things like yeah. that or no. yeah. actually i was so i should uh, for me at the age of yeah 2003 etc i was never thinking about like going into upsc etc but by the by 2008 9 i thought i one thing was clear in my mind i will not go out of india uh, that was uh, set in my mind so why why in 2008 9 i was interested in you know okay maybe there is this another route in government where people can contribute uh, so then i did start preparing for upsc at that time uh i did give two attempts uh failed on both occasions and i had decided okay i'll try twice uh that's it so that's that and i left it so i was always reading things uh trying to read as much as i can uh, i i wasn't a very voracious readers like many of your guests would have been during uh, school days etc books weren't there uh, a lot in my home so but i was okay uh, let me uh, uh, try this uh, and when upsc didn't go through i i, I was just uh, trying to read up more on other things and public policy as a word as a term didn't exist back then right it was just the only way you can be in uh, you can do something in government is to be in government through the upsc route so public policy as a idea didn't even uh, strike me but then uh, while reading a lot i came across some blogs uh, came across nitin pai's blog who's the director at takshashila started reading that uh, incidentally while playing cricket in my uh, company the texas instruments team one of the interns there told me about a course called public policy and you can take this course while working and I was like okay this is interesting let me try this and yeah that's how i got into it and found it exceptionally intriguing something which appealed to me doing a lot more reading writing uh, thinking about uh, uh, governance and public policy issues so yeah and then i changed tracks mm. what you're saying is so right you know uh, our perception of public policy is is very uh, i would say it it's not that broad um, i did not know about this term uh, i got to know of this very recently uh, and people don't realize the fact that you don't have to be uh, in 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 office when i say in office be an mp or an mla or like an ias officer to contribute uh, you can be part of institutes you can be part of so called think tanks uh, i know yamini ayer is doing great work in delhi and takshila foundation is is doing and uh, there is a brookings institution in in the us which is also like one of the bigger think tanks so there are multiple ways that uh, people can contribute yeah i'll just add to that so you mentioned the name brookings in 2016 brookings celebrated its centenary year so that's how old public policy thinking is in the us right uh, it starts with woodrow wilson and uh, that time that's when many ideas of public administration etc were formulated as well so that's how old think tanks are even in india think tanks uh, many think tanks mostly government associated during the socialist period as well but they were there were government run think tanks in and around delhi uh, right from the independence period uh, but that that was still you know within the government or government affiliates right retired government people being in there but the new generation think tanks uh, which have nothing to do uh, because of their close connections with the government and are independent uh that started a lot later and in india that wave has started just a decade ago i would say uh, so a lot of think tanks are outside delhi also so bangalore is obviously a hub uh, 
um and now things are coming up in mumbai pune and all also but um the, so yeah this is a new thing and it is a sunrise space lot of people uh, are now going through the public policy route and either joining uh, governments or companies right so i mean a lot of uh, technology firms have public policy departments uh, to engage with governments in a transparent way and put their views across so all that has happened in the last 10 years hmm. yeah fantastic background uh, pranay so you took up electronics engineering then you uh, took a course in takshashila and then uh, you hit this sweet spot where technology and public policy come together around covid time where you decide to author a book uh about about semiconductors using your own experience in the semiconductor industry as well and also uh studying uh, how geopolitics and policy works in this space um now i want to move a little bit and talk about uh the the semiconductor process itself and we will deep dive into the geopolitics aspect of it um so for a lot of people uh people do have watched advertisements of intel in their you know like uh, in the early in the late 90s or early 2000s um th- they know that it goes into the computer but you know semiconductors are so u- ubiquitous right i mean uh, nothing can work without them in this day and age so uh so so walk me through the process of how semiconductors are made right from uh procuring silicon and making or casting that silicon ingot uh let's give the the audience a 101 on what the process or the main steps are and some of the main companies or let's say one or two companies that are in that space right yeah so main steps uh, actually it's a very complicated process um, uh, the estimates are that every chip makes around four trips around the globe before it is finally made uh, so uh, but because we want to simplify it as a schematic people generally divide it into three stages it is design manufacturing and assembly so let's take a simplified version of this uh, so design begins essentially with someone saying that let's say if i have to design an apple iphone so they'll come up with some specifications that you know my iphone should be able to have a phone with this capability or these many pixels that should be able to uh, have a photo of or the latency for my uh, talking uh, um, for my communication should be less so on and so forth these are specifications that uh, an OEM uh, or a product maker will decide right once those specifications are decided you actually need to realize that in silicon right you need to make hardware to be able to uh, achieve that functionality that is what is done in the design stage so you will essentially integrate components from uh, various uh, already existing building blocks or you will create fresh uh, building blocks to achieve that functionality now when you are doing that so let's say you will decide okay i need camera of uh, maybe 64 megapixel with x y latency so for that i need to have such and such cmos sensor such and such chip etc all those things are integrated how do they connect to each other that is decided in the design stage now obviously you can't do that by hand right so earlier you could uh, but today every for example apple a16 pro uh, processor chip will have 134 million transistors per millimeter square right so you can't do that by hand you need to do that by software so that's where you use software called eda electronic uh, design automation so those are the tools which help you do this uh, using uh, certain um, amount of automation uh, so that's the main instrument through which large number of engineers will get the design right so design stage uh, uh, as a broad principle it's a human capital intensive stage you will require a large number of engineers who are using automation to integrate all these components and verify whether these components work uh sim- through simulation they work individually all right and when they are combined into a chip they work well at, at that 
process as well, right? So this is how the design stage works. The output of the design stage is nothing physical. It's just a set of files which finally tell that where the transistor should be placed, what should be the delays between them, so on and so forth. So it's just a file which tells how these transistors need to be arranged, placed uh, on a particular chip. So it's just a file, right? Now, uh, before we go to the manufacturing stage, we can quickly uh, think about some companies in this stage. So, yeah. so, so uh, think, uh, uh, you know, design is is usually done by the, the big tech companies, right? So mostly Apple, Google, uh, Microsoft, and so on. Uh, and, and they are the ones who design it and they use these so-called EDA uh, tools. And I think there are three companies in that space, uh, mostly uh, Cadence, Synopsis, and Mentor Graphics, or now it's called Siemens EDA, I think, right? Yeah, 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 right. Uh, that's true. So uh, actually, Apple and Google are new entrants to oh. this space. But uh, earlier you had, I mean, AMD, NVIDIA, these are the older players and uh, AM, now a Apple, Google have also decided that, you know, why leave the space? We can get into it. So uh, they have been uh, recent entrants. Uh, but yeah, the even Intel does a lot more on manufacturing as well, but it also obviously does design of its chips. So all these are the design companies, um, quite media tech. Uh, NVIDIA, all of these fall in this category. But an essential component, like I said, is one EDA tools, uh, you have already covered that uh, largely there are just three companies. All of them are based in the US. The Siemens EDA has obviously recently been taken over by a German company, but Mentor Graphics is still headquartered based in the US, right? So uh, its base remains in the US. It will still be subject to some export controls, which will apply if US decides to put on another country. So mm. um, this is EDA tool space. But another important component of design is, like I said, sometimes you don't want to do everything on your own. You can use prefabricated, not prefabricated, pre-built blocks which you just integrate into your design uh, so that is called intellectual property uh, uh, inter intellectual property blocks so they can be for example in the your mobile phone processor you all of them are built on a simple blueprint of a risk uh, processor which is called arm uh, just like people who have used Laptops will know Intel x86 uh, processor. In mobile phones, we don't use x86. We use a reduced instruction set computer, which is ARM. Now, this is the only company which is supplying this pre-designed uh, pre block uh, for mobile phone companies. And it is currently based in the UK. Right. So this is, again, a bottleneck from a geopolitical sense that there's just one company in one country which is supplying this. And if something were to happen to this company, everyone will feel the uh, pain. So this is one angle to keep in mind, right? So now let's say this design stage is over. You have a blueprint. What happens in the next step, right? Once this blueprint file is uh, eventually given to a manufacturing company. Now, manufacturing is a very capital intensive stage because what you have to do is you have to convert those uh, set of files into something which is a physical die, right? And if anyone has seen a wafer, uh, I actually have a wafer, I can show that. But uh, the wafer is just like a big uh, roti, I guess, uh, or you can call it a round waffle. And in the waffle, there are those squares. Those are the dies, right? So you eventually uh, want to make that uh, happen. Uh, and it has to, uh, the smallest size of uh, the, the feature size in this die will be, uh, you know, of a few nanometers. And that's why you require amazing amounts of precision, uh, amazing amount of cleanliness in that space. You've worked in a company which ma manufactures those machines, right? Uh, photolithography machines. And that is, again, a 
amazing example of human ingenuity, right? Just to be able to have that kind of machine, which is able to make things that are so fine, you know, just a few atoms apart. But essentially, you etch, carve those features that you have imagined into a physical silicon wafer, and you create all those 134 million transistors arranged in a particular way, connected in a particular way per millimeter square using these advanced machines, right? So that is what happens in the manufacturing stage. You can guess that it is a very capital intensive stage because of this reason, the purity required, the amount of uh, uh, the atmosphere required, the machines required, all that is very costly. So for example, the latest TSMC fab, which has begun in Arizona is $12 billion to begin with, right? So that's the kind of cost you need to put in just to get started. And you will be able to get the first chip out two, three years after you have begun the process. So uh, clearly not many countries and many uh, companies would want to invest in this. And that's why uh, earlier, what used to happen when this process hadn't reached this level of complexity, you had one company doing the manufacturing uh, and design together and even the third step assembly. So uh, those are called IDMs, integrated device manufacturers. But with time, as this process started becoming more and more complicated, uh, the cost of doing this kept rising. Okay, so this is what is called as the Rock's Law which is a flip uh, side to Moore's law. Moore's law was a prediction that, just a prediction, but uh, it has been held true as a law because of uh, uh, amazing amounts of human ingenuity and imagination. Uh, so Moore's law just says that the number of chips, uh, number of transistors in an IC keeps doubling every 18 months or so and this is uh, Gordon Moore when he was at Fairchild saying this and he said this when there were 64 transistors on the an, uh, an IC in Fairchild right and today we are talking about 134 million transistors per millimeter square so it has sort of held true but the flip side to that is Rock's law which says that the cost of uh, designing uh, uh, or maintaining the fab which uh, is able to achieve this kind of functionality is also increasing doubles every four years. So that is another challenge to keep in mind. And so what happened is as the costs kept increasing, fewer and fewer companies wanted to invest in the next generation technology so a new economic revolution happened you know it was just not a technological revolution it was an economic revolution where companies decided that why should i do the entire process i will just focus on one part of the supply chain and get really good at it and off offload the other parts to another company which invests its energy in getting very good at that stage and that's the economic revolution which happened because of globalization because of technology transfers and so what happened is uh, certain companies and countries started doing just contract manufacturing they said don't worry you are nvidia you are amd i don't care about it you just give me your blueprints i will give you the physical die uh, and that's what was the next step jump and this comparative advantage based specialization was the start of something really great right and that's how tsmc and uh, things in taiwan uh, companies started doing just the manufacturing stage and they started refining their recipes uh, and that led to uh, and also like you will require a lot of obviously materials for this right so the silicon wafer uh, that requires uh, you know, um, amazing amounts of silicon the way you cut it etc the materials that you require that was again not done in Taiwan that was done by uh, Shinetsu and other companies in Japan so Japanese companies which uh, had uh, which were known for their precision and 
craftsmanship and uh, these these are the companies which retained the control or, over the specialized gases required materials required and they used to supply that to tsmc tsmc was also the machines that are required to finally do this job is not done by tsmc you had asml and applied materials and um, uh, a large number of companies which were supplying the various steps that the chip has to go through for whether it is etching or lithography and so on and so forth so all that uh, were being supplied to tsmc tsmc uh, focused on getting the yield maximized right so every wafer will have some chips which will work which will not work so uh, tsmc focused on getting the yield right so that you they are able to make more profits so that was the second stage manufacturing stage uh, again uh, that that step itself is a simplification because there are so many other sub steps involved so anyways once you have the final die uh, you basically cut that uh, waffle the squares on that waffle you cut them and then you coat it so that you are not uh, uh, and you put them in a protective covering uh, and you put the connectors outside that is what you do in the assembly testing and packaging stage and that is a labor intensive process you do require specialized machines but beyond that you also require large amount of skilled and semi skilled labor so that is the third stage and that uh, happened again in east asia where costs were low and east asia was globally integrated so they could import at without any tariffs and quickly do some value addition by doing this work and then export it again right so that is the next step which happened in uh, again taiwan south korea and now china china is a big player in the assembly testing and packaging stage so once that assem uh, uh, atp happens you finally have a final ic which goes into many many uh, Uh, products and there's an entire distribution supply chain which we have not even discussed so this is how it is sort of placed uh, it is a lot more complicated but i have tried to give a simplified version of how this uh, industry works um, yeah 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 i mean i think i think you summed it up pretty perfectly uh, and and you mentioned about uh, taiwan and taiwan semiconductor uh, and some of the other companies are like samsung intel who also do similar things uh, not to the level of uh, tsmc but uh, uh, around the same uh, this thing and then once the uh, once the chip is cut uh, then it's usually you know manufacturers like uh, can i say foxconn uh, who use these to or or is there a middle no. middle layer yeah so i'll i'll just give some names so i forgot to mention the names in each stage but uh, so like you said yeah manufacturing is done even in europe it is also done in the us in fact uh, today if you look at the number of fabs uh, which are operating uh, the american continent still has the largest number of fabs uh, it's not in other countries but it is trailing edge fabs so these are old fabs which are not at the most cutting edge and actually for most of our applications uh, we don't need the most cutting edge chips maybe for a uh, laptop and an apple iphone you do but we have so many appliances we don't need the most cutting edge chips so uh, global foundries is another company which does that uh, infineon also has some fab so texel instruments used to have analog fabs it still does so uh, th- there are many companies which have uh, run which run fabs outside in israel there is tower semiconductors as well so uh, but yeah it, right now we are talking about taiwan etc because those are the most advanced semiconductors and taiwan because of the geopolitics around it has become a big bottleneck Okay. yeah so this is the uh, manufacturing stage in the assembly testing and packaging stage it's not done by foxconn it is done by companies like jset uh, amcor in taiwan jset in china so these are largely companies which you wouldn't know of you know like they are not 
uh, in fact tsmc also uh, you were in the industry so you would know but for a person who's in software or who's just a user they would have never heard of tsmc and there was no good reason for them to hear because uh, they were just contract manufacturers really bloody good at what they did but the when the supply chain works well you don't care about where it is coming from so uh, finally when the chip is made then you have to do electronics assembly right so you need to put all those chips on a pcb and you have to arrange it that is what foxconn and the likes do hmm. yeah makes sense and uh... TSMC uh, also is is the leader and the cutting edge in uh, five nanometer, right? Because that's one of the reasons why we are able to put in hundred billion transistors. And to give a a bit of a context, this this whole five nanometer thing started in twenty twenty. And to give a brief timeline on how far we got in the probably the last twenty uh, fifteen to twenty years. So two thousand four was ninety nanometer. 2007 was 45, 2012 was 22, 2016 was 14, and 2020 was 5 nanometer. And we are expected to go to like 2 to 3 nanometer in 2024 uh, and, and so on. So it's it's crazy to see how fast we came to 5 nanometer, right? Yeah, I mean, that's the fascinating thing about that a vague idea, a prediction that someone made, it has actually become a law, right? And in, it has held true for 60 years now. Uh, after 90, it was made, the prediction was a yeah. 1965 prediction. And it has uh, held true because it became sort of a guiding light that you have to achieve that goal. And uh, there were various things done in the background to make this happen, right? The design of transistors itself, how does it, how can a transistor work? Uh, so a transistor at five nanometer looks very different from a transistor at 25, uh, 28 nanometers, right? So there are fin fets now and amazing amount of complications, but a lot of device physics is involved in that. So there are a large amount of research which goes into this. And we didn't talk about that because I didn't want to complicate, but there are a large amount of research firms which are involved. So IMEC in Belgium, for example, is a firm which does a lot of leading level work on device physics and making a transistor work at that small size and yet achieve the functionality you want with minimum leakage current and all that. So this all is an amazing way of uh, economic and technological revolution happening simultaneously uh, and globally to keep this miracle uh, year on year, uh, keeping making it continue. Yeah. And, and the things that we spoke about, I think uh, the listeners might have noticed that it is in the hands of a few countries. So, uh, for instance, the chip design is primarily in the US. So these big tech companies that we talk about um, and then EDA companies that we discussed are in the US. Then the manufacturing predominantly is Asia and the US. Uh, I know we touched on a few companies in Japan and China. Um, so from a geopolitical standpoint, I know we'll get into that in a bit. Uh, it's It's focused on a few countries and it's not a global uh, thing. Um, but now talking about semiconductors, I mean, semiconductors have been around for a long time. And uh, I think the the big, uh, the time when they burst into the scene was, was around Cold War when USSR and US were sort of pushing the boundaries in, in tech. Uh, and the Soviet Union was one of the first countries or the first country to uh, recognize the importance of computing uh, before, even before the US, but uh, it could not produce tech. Like it kind of fell behind. Uh, any any reason why? Yeah, uh, that's an important question. But before that, I'll just uh, add a nuance there. A lot of the design companies are American and Taiwanese and uh, South Korean, but a lot of the design work happens in India. Uh, because top 10 semiconductor fabulous companies by revenue all have their design centers in Bangalore uh, and they are at various levels of development. So some companies might just be offshoring a small uh, block, 
but there are many companies like texas instruments when i used to work there a lot of architect le architecture level work used to happen there uh, so uh, so a lot of uh, design work now happens in india um, some estimates are that you know 90% of the chips that get made have something uh, being done in india related to it this is a estimate i don't think there is good data on it but i can confidently say because it requires a large number of engineers these might not be uh, all all of these engineers might not be doing the most cutting edge research work but you do need uh, a good engineer to do this uh, not a good scientist but you need a good engineer and that that happens in india a lot um, so that's just one uh, point that i wanted to add even for eda for example all eda companies yeah. they have a large base in india in bangalore in fact and uh, apart from that these companies again outsource some component of their design work to other services companies which also happens in india so there will be for example uh, intel india will not do all design in intel india they will probably uh, outsource some component of it to another company like mindtree or infosys or tcs people th associate infosys tcs with software services but they also have units which provide uh, you know, hardware services so that also happens in the indian angle yeah. so that is one i'm so glad like, you mentioned yeah. that yeah because uh, like you said you know people associate infosys mindtree all of these with uh, uh, software outsourcing but uh, they also do a lot of uh, hardware uh, design yeah yeah uh, design services so that is one and then yeah coming to your question on ussr so this is a very dear topic to me uh, to look at what happens in these kinds of industries so actually you can the story of ussr uh, china before 1978 reforms and india is pretty much similar so all of them realized the importance of semiconductors way early china india, got, did. Oh, india got, did as well yes 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 mm. uh, since the 1950s there has been uh, an idea that we have to get our own uh, transistors and then IC and we did start off by doing that. China be, uh, made I think its first IC before Taiwan did uh, and even USSR had some early successes but what happens in all these three ecosystems is one they are all done by government run companies so initially there is some exuberance there is some effort that you know we have to get there uh, quickly so government companies are able to get things done early but you have to understand how we talked earlier it requires constant capital infusion right every few years you need to uh, upgrade the technology you will need to put millions of dollars back then as well that is not what a government company can do Right, the with if you are operating within uh, the government, you have constraints on uh, doing that, etc. Second, in order to do that kind of capital investment, the only way you can justify that capital investment is when you are producing millions and millions of chips, so that you can get some revenue out of it uh, and offset the investment that you have done. Which means the only way you survive is actually serving the commercial sector. Uh, but when you are a government run company that is not your main objective right you are not looking at export deals you are largely focusing on servicing your own uh, defense or space or some strategic industry so there the incentive to invest in capital take uh, that much of uh, uh, reinvestment over and over year doesn't exist in government companies so that is a second reason why these didn't succeed. The third one is integration with the global supply chain is very important. All these three were isolated for different reasons. Uh, in India, for example, we know that there were very strict export control and import control uh, regimes because foreign exchange preservation was a big priority so if you if a company were to import a lot of things and use precious foreign exchange for this the government felt this would be in not in our interest so all these companies wanted intermediary products to make good chips but 
they couldn't easily import things. Machines would be stuck in customs for months and months. So eventually they just fell behind. So in fact, India, we have a chapter on India where BEL started making chips, uh, transistors pretty early. They got the technology transfer from the US uh, and they were able to get that done. Uh, SCL, Semiconductor Complex Limited in India was also able to do that uh, early. But eventually, uh, they all, for all these three reasons, they fell behind. And another complication is when you're in, inside a government, the government's imagination is when two companies are trying to do this, it's not, they don't see it from the lens of competition, but they see it from the lens of wastage. Like, why are two companies doing the same thing? So they eventually said that SCL should do chips and BEL should not do chips and just do the integration and do uh, products based on the chips that SCL has made. So with no competition, there is no incentive within the government to innovate as well. So this was the general story of uh, China, uh, yeah, USSR and India as well. Um, USSR had another uh, big problem that they were more isolated from the US uh, industry than uh, India. Right? For example, India and Taiwan and China, all these uh, and Japanese companies and South Korea and Samsung, all of them began by some sort of technology transfer from the US because that was where things began and they were off the blocks early. But USSR had no such option. So they tried to steal. They tried to do a lot of uh, espionage, get things up. But uh, unless you could do that in the beginning, but for the next generation of semiconductors and the next you have to be integrated in the research uh, and, and technological ecosystem which they weren't so they fell behind even today russia is not a big power in this domain at all and that's their big weakness uh, you saw that in the russia ukraine war as well they are uh, suffering because of that and that's why in fact us again stopped uh, supply of chips to Russia because that is where Russia is at its weakest and that it will have second order effects on India's defense industry as well. Hmm. Yeah, I'm glad you touched on India and China and it is, uh, I had no idea that India got started so early and I mentioned about the U USSR because they were in this arms race and uh, the whole uh, idea of chips was was started with the Pentagon and you know missile guidance systems and all of that. So that's one of the reasons why I started with uh, with the Soviet Union. But uh, but it's interesting to see that uh, uh, BEL and SCL also got it got started much much early than we than we would have assumed. So uh, fantastic, um, Pranay. Now I want to talk about where we are now. And I think we briefly touched on it uh, while we were talking about Taiwan Semiconductor. Um, uh, and it produces, you know, almost 90% of advanced process chips uh, powering phones and PCs. And uh, TSMC actually produces one third of world's uh, new computing power annually. Uh, so now that we are in this state, um, what... Uh, how does it impact geopolitically? Because uh, Samsung, Micron, Intel, TSMC are the main players. And uh, there is this tussle between uh, China and Taiwan and the US uh, and all of that. So so where do we stand now as things, as things are? Right. So uh, now that we know the industry structure, the thing to keep in mind here is that uh, when it works well, it works perfectly, right? We don't even need to bother about who's making this chip. It just used to work fine. But things changed for a few reasons. Uh, one was the fact that uh, when US-China contestation started, now US-China geopolitics-wise, when the contestations started, uh, the reason that US and China can't go for a big conventional war is because both are nuclear powers. They can't even engage in a long-standing economic war because or economic uh, sanctions because, again, their ecosystems are so 
tightly coupled uh, and there will be huge costs that US companies will incur if they were to say that we will not supply to China, we will not buy from China. So that is also not happening. So what is the domain where the contest can happen? The only domain is technology domain. So that's one area. And within technology also, which are the areas where this could happen? Uh, now, amongst all the things that China has done, one weakness is in semiconductors. That's perhaps their biggest weakness in the technological stack, if you will, uh, because they don't have the kind of capabilities or the dominance that US and its partners have. So from that lens, the US tried to confront China on this uh, more than anything else, right? Not in software, not in other areas, but hardware. Also, it's hardware is easy to control. So uh, this is where uh, easier, I wouldn't say easy, but easier comparatively. So that's where the fight started on the semiconductor angle and not elsewhere, right? That was the first uh, reason. The second one is China-Taiwan relations are also worsening, not because of semiconductors, but there are other bigger political imperatives that the Chinese government has with respect to Taiwan and reintegration. But whatever happens to Taiwan will have repercussions across the world. Uh, so F-35 uh, uh, military aircraft in the US, for example, they do their chips are not made in the US fabs, they would have been made, some part of it would at least be made in Taiwan. So those are the risks that US faces if China were to invade Taiwan for whatever reason. So that so these are the two geopolitical imperatives why semiconductors became uh, came into the spotlight. The second uh, imperative is the geoeconomic imperative. And um, I like this statement by Willy Shi at the Harvard Business School. He compares this structure as a transcontinental relay race with hidden hurdles. So this is a transcontinental relay race. People are passing baton from one stage to the other. Uh, but there are hidden hurdles because every stage has two or three dominant players. And what if they were to stop things for some reason? Not for geopolitical reason alone. So what if let's say there is a drought in Taiwan and that has been a real risk. What if there's an earthquake in Japan? What if ASML is not able to provide the next generation or next shipment of EUV for some reason, you know, or their investment uh, or their board has some problems with the CEO like we had uh, another case in another company recently, right? Any of those things will have really big downstream consequences for the entire world. And a real case of this happened during the COVID-19 pandemic, where automotive companies really felt the heat. Uh, they, uh, they stopped putting orders in this contract manufacturing firms when the pandemic happened. Uh, and meanwhile, all of us went over Zoom. So uh, all these contract manufacturing slots got occupied by consumer electronics. So when the demand again rose, the automotive players had no slots available. Uh, and uh, anyways, automotive chips are not as remunerative for the contract manufacturers as the most advanced chips are. So they were not able to get those slots. And so that again drove a huge amount of, uh, uh, that draw, drew attention of a common person as well across the world, right? Uh, uh, there were many cars which uh, had faced delays, not just the most advanced cars, even uh, usual cars and even medical equipment, etc., had this problem. So that was a geoeconomic imperative. And the third one is even there's a technological imperative for semiconductors because if you want to do the next uh, AI co-processor chip or the next AI training chip, which is, goes beyond the GPU, you will need a new semiconductor architecture and chip design. Or if you want to design a 6G uh, baseband chip, you will need something new, right? So for that lens, I call semiconductors as metacritical, not just critical. So these three reasons are why we are seeing all governments rise to the importance of this. Uh, and they are trying to take various steps in order to secure or make the supply chain more resilient than it is currently. Mm. You know, there's so much monopoly of 
ASML in the EUV uh, segment and uh, no other company is doing it and there is absolutely no competition. Uh, and we have seen over time that any company that becomes a monopoly or that does not have competition stops to innovate and the next generation of innovation comes from a startup or something. Uh, and because it is such a labor intensive and the entry barrier is so high, uh, what do you think is going on in the EUV lithography space? Is ASML going to con going to continue dominating the market for the next few years? Yeah, right. Uh, one thing is, it's not just ASML because ASML got built with Intel's help and uh, and the government help and US and uh, Netherlands, etc. So actually, it is it does what it does because of extensive collaboration with many contract manufacturers, etc. Right. And, um, you know, Carl Zeiss is again another supplier for the mirrors that are used in the UV process and all that. So it's actually, you can think of it as a consortium of many companies collaborating to get the next generation of UV out. And ASML didn't get here very easily, right? I think they wanted to make EUV in 2000 or something. So it took them a lot more time than they had also budgeted for it. And it has become incredibly complicated uh, now. So, but what we should uh, not discount is that right now it was okay for nation states to be dependent on ASML because they didn't have an incentive to find an alternative with full force and rigor because they were getting what they were. Uh, but now with the kinds of things which are happening between US and China, there is an incentive for many nation states to find alternatives. So for example, some people are now talking about nano imprint lithography, which is an old technology that Canon, a competitor of ASML has been trying from a long time. But now there'll be renewed energy in trying to invest uh, uh, energy, time, research in getting an alternative up, right? So it might not replace uh, for five nanometer chip, but maybe for silicon photonics or some uh, other alternatives, you might have another alternative to the conventional photolithography processes. So uh, I don't discount the fact that whenever there are very intense periods of geopolitical competitions you can also have non-linear breakthroughs in technologies so uh, and that's what might happen uh, in this decade as well mm. that is so true because a uh, similar thing happened with uh, with the aircraft in industry right boeing used to dominate it for the longest time and then uh, some companies pulled together and formed Airbus uh, and 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 they are doing well. So maybe we can see something of uh, something similar in this space. But yeah, as long as things are going well, everything is going well. So so that's that's fine. Um, now talking about the supply chain, supply chain is discussed quite a bit. And like you mentioned, uh, before a chip goes into the phone, it it makes four trips um, around the world, right? Um, what is so special about uh, the supply chain and how did it work previously like clockwork and what was the main disruptor? Uh, was it COVID or was it something else? Yeah, I mean, all the three which I said were the disruptors as a confluence of geopolitical uh, things happening and geoeconomic uh, reasons which were brought to the fore by the shortage caused during the pandemic and the technological imperative and the fact that nation states are sensitive that technology will become a bigger component of national power and if that is the case being a player in that sector is important so mm -hmm. that is the reason so why it was working perfectly is one because there was comparative advantage based specialization every AMD didn't have to invest billions of dollars to make the next generation of their processor chip. They could just focus on making getting the design right, right? Uh, whereas uh, Taiwan, TSMC could just focus on getting the recipe of uh, manufacturing right. So that is what made it work. Globalization made it work. Uh, there is also an ITA agreement under the WTO, which uh, makes tariffs zero on all 
uh, ICT products, information communication uh, technology. So that was also important. Uh, that enabled uh, some company to just do manufacturing and then pass the design to Taiwan and then Taiwan will just do the assembly and they will then export it out or China will do the assembly and export it out. So all that were really crucial for this industry to work. For example, I always tell people, uh, you know, you know what is the biggest export of Taiwan? Uh, semiconductor. Right? Yeah, semiconductor. But yeah. what is the biggest import of Taiwan? Um. Wow, good question. It's semiconductors. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. So you need you need imports you need uh, imports to do exports also in this industry there's no exports without imports and that's uh, uh, just an illustration to show that integration with the world is very important uh, mm -hmm. another illustration that i give people is if china were to take over taiwan uh, it's not as if uh, China will be able to take control of all facilities and they'll work the way they do now because uh, I'm in fact uh, the chairman of TSMC Mark Liu is on record saying that a TSMC which will be occupied by China will be uh, perfectly useless for China because it, uh, TSMC relies on a lot of global collaboration, materials from Japan, you know, uh, uh, things, uh, ASML machines to uh, do all that. So if China were to occupy Taiwan, all this will stop. So you will have all the uh, uh, technology and the buildings available, but you will not be able to make the machines, uh, make the chips that you want. So, mm. uh, so all this worked perfectly uh, and things were okay uh, and they they just worked perfectly but now because of these three reasons where you have a confluence of geopolitical geoeconomic and technological imperatives things have gone a bit awry and uh, countries are trying to make this more resilient but i do think right now they're trying a lot of indigenization their hope is that we will do a lot of these things at home. But there is a reason why you couldn't do that at home, right? That's why the industry st structure evolved in this way. It's not as if someone planned it this way, but it evolved for very good reasons. So my uh, current uh, guess is that right now, everyone is talking about this industry. So there's a lot of money being pumped in, but three, four years down the line, when the industry goes through a downturn, as it often does, uh, they will realize that interdependence is a necessity. Uh, you can't do things at home. Uh, the way I put it is plurilateral cooperation is a necessity and not a choice. So there will be some uh, modus vivendi that they'll come to that, okay, maybe for certain chips, which are very, very specific to military, we will have some form of extra controls. But other than that, you will have this uh, globalized structure again forming uh, with maybe some alterations maybe China will not be such a big component of it you will have uh, India and other countries becoming a part of this but that will still be required you can't have even US being able to do all of this on its own mm. yeah looks like uh, uh, it is uh, it is globalized globalization that enabled this uh, innovation at such a fast pace and no one country can uh, completely have a stronghold. Um, so it's not that much of a worry, even if China takes control over Taiwan, it can't really do much about TSMC uh, as such. However, uh, we see that some, some countries are trying to form partnerships uh, to secure supply chains, uh, like the Chip4 Alliance and, and all of that. Um, what is the agenda behind that? And... Uh, Will that be fruitful in the in the long run? Yeah. So, yeah, I mean, first of all, I should say, I mean, if China were to occupy Taiwan, that will be very bad for many other reasons, but right. not the, the semiconductor. But uh, so the alliance thing, as I said, because of comparative advantage based specialization, US, for example, if the same chip that TSMC makes in Taiwan versus what it will make in its Arizona factory, 
will cost 30 percent more the same chip the same people the same company so how long why will any american company buy this chip from an american firm? why wouldn't they just buy it from tsmc taiwan right so these are the kinds of things we will see come to fore after this euphoria uh, goes away so i think many nations it's realized that, that you can't go the full hog and that's why you need cooperation with other countries. So uh, CHIP4 is one, Quad, the India, Australia, uh, Japan and US, they also have a semiconductor supply chain initiative. US and EU are talking about this in the Trade and Tech Council. India and EU are talking about uh, semiconductors in their TTC. So this has become uh, an important point of collaboration in many forms in in many formations uh, and i think that is a good step uh, we should think of semiconductor industry as a sort of a digital infrastructure for the world and you it is good if it is resilient overall you know uh, uh, it benefits every nation state uh, so it it's it's of that uh, nature uh, and yeah, so right now the understanding is that provided that there is some geopolitical alignment, uh, then it is okay to have this industry diversified within that uh, geopolitical formation or alliance. But if it's controlled by your adversary, then there is a problem. Uh, and that's why because of the fact that the US is uh, so closely coupled with China in a variety of spheres, including in semiconductors, and now they are competing on a number of fronts. That is what makes uh, them uh, unsettled. Uh, so now the attempt is that can some portion of this be done in other friendlier countries? And the word they use is trusted sources and trusted ecosystems rather than do this across adversaries. Mm. Yeah, great, uh, great point to segue into India. And India has made a significant push in investing in semiconductors. Uh, however, uh, I noticed that India is uh, pushing towards more of the older technology, uh, which is the 28 nanometer or 40 nanometer. We have had some bidders in, in, in that area. Where does India stand and what is India looking to push? Yeah. So, like TSMC got to where it did over 40 years, right? It started in 1987 and today it is what it is. So, you can't get into this industry right away and hope that things work because it's not just a technical challenge. You can find good people, but you need uh, to really do... This is the pinnacle of large-scale manufacturing, and precision manufacturing yeah, on that note, on, is, on that hmm. note uh, about large scale manufacturing and and the resources required right uh, what burden does it uh, put on natural resources you we briefly touched on water uh, but otherwise uh, do you do you have an estimate or an idea of of how how much impact that does it put on the environment and natural resources uh, actually, it's not much now. In the 70s, 80s, it was a highly environmentally polluting process as well. So that was also one reason why companies, American companies were very happy to offload it to another country, which is happy to take that burden for its own benefit. Right. So Taiwan was, uh, the East Asian economies were ready to take that cost. And that's why uh, the American companies were also happy to offload it. But over the years, there has been a lot of advancement done in the technology. So it's not that polluting a thing compared to any other large scale uh, unit. Okay, So uh, that is uh, something to keep in mind. Um, you uh, So you're talking about the Indian approach. Uh, so the Indian approach has been, from my understanding, one, this time they want to have a role across the supply chain. So they have, they are not doing piecemeal things. They have something for design. They have a policy separately for manufacturing. They have a separate policy for assembly and all that. So they want to build the entire ecosystem. Uh, and I think we need a 20-year plan, right? So we won't get start doing this 
today or even in two years or five years. You need to start the process now and probably we'll get to where we want later. But the crucial question is what should be, what should India do, right? Now, if you look at it from the objective, the policy objective could be probably three in my mind. One is to actually uh, double down on your strengths and get really good at it such that uh, you can't do everything else, uh, in the supply chain, but no other country can. So you will at least have some leverage uh, because you are really good in one segment of the supply chain, which for India is design. So idea is, can you really ensure that the design ecosystem across the world has Indian engineers everywhere, you know, and Indian expertise runs it. That's the quickest thing that you can do. And that is probably a leverage that you can have if another nation state were to constrain you in some uh, other segment of the supply chain. So this is one goal. The second goal could be to actually reduce strategic vulnerability. That is you over time want your defense equipment to have your own chips etc right so again it can't happen today or tomorrow it could it will take some time but it's just something that you want to learn and you have need to have an ecosystem which is able to do this over time so that's what you would do in the manufacturing uh, stage right now the third goal that the indian government has is to reduce in import dependence on china and that's why they are trying to do things on displays also like mobile phone displays etc or all that so my assessment is that actually we don't need to worry so much about import dependence on china it's okay if we are importing some chips from there none of those chips are uh, so specifically designed for india that they can be hacked only for indians and people will not know there are technological ways to get around that problem so it's okay for us to keep importing from china but our goal should be not so much to get obsessed about getting a fab today or tomorrow or an assembly uh, unit today or tomorrow but probably to actually capitalize on our strengths which is design uh, and get really good at that simultaneously start running that marathon of doing good in manufacturing so it's okay if we have a fab i you said 28 nanometer it will be great even if india has a 65 nanometer analog fab you know it's, you have to start somewhere and it's okay to start at a, a lower base build that ecosystem and get to where you want uh, assembly is another space where it is more promising actually because Micron uh, announced a plant during the Indian PM's visit to the US and that is one which is more likely where you will start having assembly being done in India because electronics assembly is already happening now. The next stage is to do chip assembly. Once chip assembly uh, picks up, then there is more incentive for companies to do fabs, right? Do the even the chip making in the same country so it's sort of a ladder that you have to climb uh, over time and that's what uh, the government should be aiming right now i feel they're too obsessed on reducing dependence on china uh, uh, and not so much on our capitalizing our strengths which is on design um, so uh, the goal the direction is right but the priorities are probably a bit uh, flipped up uh, compared to where I would want it to be. Mm. Yeah, I don't think this is talked about enough because um, and and it's great coming from an expert or someone with a background in in electronics is that we need to focus on design because we have been doing that for quite a while and India is quite a, a powerhouse. Like you mentioned, uh, you know, a, a lot of the designing is done in India, so it's it would be better to focus on that strength than leapfrogging our way into uh, into manufacturing because of the high high entry barrier and i think a lot of this has to do with the geopolitical tensions between india and china and uh, i hope people really put their head down and focus on priorities like i mentioned uh, like you mentioned so um, yeah fantastic and i think this episode quite uh, serves as the 101 of uh, semiconductors and whoever wants to uh, take an interest in uh, you know semiconductor as a public policy topic or 
or as as an engineer i think this is a great starting point so thank you so much pranay for your time uh, absolutely loved talking and i loved the way how you broke it down uh, and and uh, it will make it so easy to understand for all the listeners so thank you so much thank you and all the best for the podcast keep keep continuing thank you yeah thanks